Good morning and welcome to today's Finance Committee hearing. My name is Julissa Ferreras Copeland and I am the chair of the committee. I want to acknowledge the members who are here. We have Minority Leader Mario and Majority Leader Van Bramer. This morning the committee will con conclude our hearings of the Mayor's Fiscal 18's Executive Budget. We will hear first from Director Dean Foulihan of the Office of Management and Budget, followed by New York City Comptroller Scott Stringer and the Independent Budget Office. Members of the public will have an opportunity to testify in th this afternoon, beginning at approximately 1 p.m. For members of the public who will be testifying, we will be organizing our panels by topics. So please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the topic area of your testimony. Any senior or person with disability who requires any accommodation for an earlier panel, please make a note on your witness slip so that we know you are here and can plan accordingly. Spanish translation services are also available. I should probably say that in Spanish. Right. Eh, tendremos traductores en español si son necesarios. Por favor, pueden hablar con los agentes. If any member of the public would prefer to submit written testimony, you can still submit your testimony to the Finance Division on the Council's website at council.nyc.gov backslash budget backslash testimony, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. We will be accepting testimony until 5 p.m. on Monday, May 29th. Before we get started, I want to first thank the Council Finance Director, um, Latanya McKinney, and her entire staff, including the Budget Unit, the Revenue and Economic, and Economic Unit, Discretionary and Data Support Unit, and Administrative Support Unit, and the Finance Council for all their hard work in preparing these hearings. I also want to thank the Sergeant at Arms, who keep us safe and help things run smoothly. They include Director of Security Carl Diabla, Chief Sergeant at Arms Rafael Perez, Sergeant at Arms John Biando, Dane Hope, Mohammed Arshad, Jessica Pellegrino, Hannah Doatanj, Mackenzie Joseph, Sakim Bradley, uh, Edwin Lopez, Xavier Odehiran. Also, would like to thank um, the team at WNYC Media who who allow those at home and at work to follow along with these hearings. Um, John Vigoa, Isaac Sarponga, Brian Francis, Amir Shukalik, Agron Seca, Elliot Stern, Ivan Peña, and Tony Austin. Thank you all for your dedication and work. The city adopts the fiscal 2018's budget at a time of great uncertainty about the future of critical programs and services that help many of our most vulnerable population. President Trump's released his, this proposed budget on Tuesday. This devastating plan cuts billions from vital programs, including SNAP, that earned income, uh, the earned income and child tax credits, Medicaid and housing assistance. Millions of New Yorkers, including seniors, children, and people with disability, will be impacted. In light of this, I remain concerned that too many city agencies have failed to develop contingencies if these drastic cuts are imposed. The council will stand with the administration as it continues to fight against these proposals, but we must also be confident that, there, that we are beginning to plan carefully for what may come. Before we start, I want to provide a brief overview of the executive budget process to date. On April 26, Mayor de Blasio released the administration's fiscal 2018's executive budget totaling approximately $84.9 billion. The Council was glad to see that this budget included several proposals that we advocated for, including providing air conditioners in all public school classrooms, enhancing support for immigrant services, defunding the proposed jail facility at Rikers Island, while funding borough-based jails and reducing excessive uh, capital appropriations. However, it failed to include key Council priorities, such as additional summer and year-round youth jobs, universal school lunch, enhanced funding for social services, and increased support for the emergency food assistance program. On May 4th, the Council began fulfilling our charter-mandated responsibility of holding public hearings on the executive budget with testimony from OMB. Over the following three weeks, 27 Council committees heard approximately 100 hours of testimony from over 30 agencies. The Council extensively questioned agency heads on operations and priorities for their respective agencies and the extent to which they are addressed in the executive plan. This administration has worked well with the Council for the past three budgets. Together we have accomplished many important victories for the people of New York City. It is our hope that this year's adopted budget continues this progress, reflecting the values and priorities of both the Council and the Mayor. 
However, this requires the budgetary transparency essential to ensure that the Council can be an equal partner in the budget process. This morning, we conclude uh, where we began with testimony from OMB Director. We return to OMB for a second time because the Council believes that the City's budget, as it currently stands, does not appropriately reflect the vision of both the Council and the Mayor. This hearing will begin will give us an opportunity to discuss our outstanding concerns and to restate our core priorities in light of the testimony we have heard during these hearings. I would like to highlight a few areas in particular. The Council has made reform for the City's capital process a top priority. We have long advocated for changes to how the city plans its long-term capital agenda, and we have encouraged agencies to develop methods to perform capital work more efficiently and economically. This year, we recommended that the administration align the capital plan with the city's ability to execute projects and establish a task force to speed the completion of projects. We were encouraged by the administration acting on the request of the Council and reducing $3.2 billion excess capital appropriations in the executive budget. However, between the prelim and the executive budgets, the administration increased both the capital commitment plan for fiscal 2017 to 2021 and the 10-year capital strategy by approximately 7%. This increase was done without corresponding strategy for completing capital projects in a more efficient manner. We have asked agency after agency how they actually plan to accommodate the increase in capital funds included in their budget for fiscal 2018, and nearly all of them were unable to give a specific answer. The practice of continually front-loading capital budgets and rolling massive amounts of unspent capital into the following fiscal year must end and give way to a more transparent and realistic capital plan. Both myself as a finance chair and the council as a whole look forward to working with the administration towards this end. Furthermore, there has been a lack of transparency on a number of significant administration initiatives and plans. This makes it difficult for the council to assess them properly. Significant among these was the proposed partial citywide hiring freeze of administrative and managerial staff. Because um, the issuance of guidance on this plan went well into the budget hearings, agencies were unable to provide us any detail about how it would affect them. I would like to receive more information about this plan, including the scale affected agencies and the possibility of permanent savings at today's hearing. Additionally, we heard from agencies such as ACS and DIFTA that they were in discussions with OMB about additional funding for new needs, but heard nothing about the substance or feasibility of these requests. Given that the Council's budget response specifically included requests for these agencies, it is concerning that we were unable to receive more details at these hearings. In addition, affected agencies express uncertainty about how compliance with the recently adopted Raise the Age law, the planned closing of Rikers, and the implementation of the Mayor's Homeless Plan will impact their budgets. This lack of information on such critical matters at this stage in the budget process is unacceptable. Finally, I would continue to urge the administration to increase the city's reserves. As I mentioned during the first OMB hearing, while total reserves were brought to $9.3 billion in the executive plan, the ratio of reserves to adjust, adjusted total spending is only 10.7%. This is below the recommended ratio of between 12 and 18%. With the continued risk posed by the federal government and the slowing of the city's economy, the reserves must be adequate to ensure the continued stability of vital city programs and services. I look forward to hearing about these issues and many more from Director Foulihan. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that each member will have five minutes um, for their first round of questions. Um, after you're sworn in, you may begin your testimony and we will hear from Director Foulihan. And we've been Thank joined you. by Council Member Lander. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? I do. Great. Thank you. Finance Tier, Jalissa Ferraris Copeland, members of the Finance Committee and members of the City Council. Thank you for this additional opportunity to testify on the Mayor's fiscal year 2018 executive budget. Again, I, I join your thanks to Latanya McKinney and the entire Council Finance staff who have been partners with us for the, for the past uh, three and a half years and uh, I know that partnership will continue as we move to adoption. 
Uh, I'm joined at the table by OMB First Deputy Director Larry Angelo and the dedicated and hardworking OMB staff is also here to assist me in answering your questions. At the hearing on May 4th, I outlined in detail the elements of the executive budget. Uh, to quickly get to your questions, I'm going to provide a very broad overview of that testimony and of our executive budget. Our fiscal year 2018 executive budget is $84.86 billion, and both fiscal year 2017 budget and the fiscal year 2018 budget are balanced under generally accepted accounting principles. We reduced our revenue estimates in the executive budget by $567 million for the upcoming fiscal year, recognizing moderate revenue growth. We made new strategic investments and continued our citywide savings program. We maintain our manageable out-year gaps when compared to prior years, and together we achieve the highest level of reserves of any city administration. And our $95.85 billion 10-year capital strategy keeps infrastructure in a state of good repair, promotes health and safety, and expands access to education and opportunity. I also discussed, and you did as well on both the, the first hearing and today, the risks and uncertainties we face at the federal level, including cuts to critical services. On Tuesday, the President released the federal fiscal year 2018 budget that confirmed the federal administration's intention to cut funding for critical programs, including public safety and the programs that protect the most vulnerable members of our community. It would force cities and states to absorb over $610 billion in additional cuts to Medicaid. Over 3 million New Yorkers currently receive Medicaid and 1.4 million are enrolled through the Affordable Care Act exchange. It would cut $6 billion from the Children's Health Insurance Program, threatening health care for 125,000 New York City children. Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program would be reduced by $193 billion over 10 years. 1.7 million New Yorkers receive SNAP. Temporary assistance for needy families would be reduced by $21.7 billion over 10 years. 140,000 New Yorkers rely on TANF. The budget would eliminate, the proposed federal budget would eliminate the Community Development Block Grant funds that benefit low and middle income New Yorkers and help revitalize deteriorating neighborhoods throughout the country. It cuts $72.5 billion in funding to Social Security Disability Insurance and Supplemental Social Security Income. And the city could lose up to $190 million in Homeland Security grants we receive annually harming our ability to protect critical assets and preparing for emergencies. In addition, the House of Representatives repeal of the Affordable Care Act would cut $800 billion in funding to Medicaid by rolling back ACA Medicaid expansion and capping Medicaid funding to states, changing the very nature of the 50-year history of Medicaid as, as an entitlement. At the same time, this bill would also eliminate individual employer mandates and the tax credits and subsidies that help make health insurance affordable for individuals. The Trump tax plan would be equally harmful to New Yorkers and could cost city residents $7.7 billion in lost state and local tax deductions. We are actively engaged with our federal delegation, business and labor, partners across the country in challenging these destructive policies. The mayor has been clear. We will fight all attempts by the federal government to cut services that touch every New Yorker, particularly the most vulnerable. And we've already seen some success last month. The federal budget passed earlier this month, the one that concluded the current federal fiscal year, contained no meaningful cuts to programs New Yorkers depend on, and, and it provided reimbursements for our security at Trump Towers. And that is irrespective of the $17 billion nationally that the President had proposed for the continuation of the current fiscal year. With these uncertainties and challenges in mind, we have taken a balanced approach to the executive budget. We now have an historic level of general reserves, $1 billion for each year of our four-year financial plan compared to the traditional level of $300 million. 
The mayor and the council established the first ever capital stabilization reserve, now at $250 million every year over the four-year financial plan. This is in addition to the Retiree Health Benefit Trust Fund, which is at an unprecedented $4 billion, $3.3 billion, the result of actions taken by this administration and this council. Our total reserves for fiscal year 2018 are now $5.25 billion. At the mayor's request, we have continued to find new savings. We will use space more efficiently and procure goods and services more effectively. We took $1 billion in savings in November, another $1.1 billion in January, and $700 million in the executive budgets across fiscal year 2017 and 2018. In addition, the mayor directed us to implement a partial hiring freeze on city-funded managerial administrative and support positions. And our health care agreement with the Municipal Labor Committee will result in additional $1.3 billion in savings in fiscal year 2018 while providing better care for our employees. Mindful of this financial and political backdrop, in the executive budget we built on prior investments by ex ex expanding successful programs, making targeted investments, and deepening commitments we have made to New Yorkers. For example, this fall, we will roll out high-quality, universal 3K for all programs in two school districts. And by 2021, with assistance our state and federal governments, all New York families will have access to this signature program. Additionally, we will install air conditioning in every New York City classroom by fiscal year 2022. The mayor has been making, has been making New York City affordable for all. Just last week, the mayor announced the largest one-year decline in New York City near poverty rates since 2005. This is the first statistically significant one-year drop since the Great Recession. The executive budget makes strides to protect and create affordable housing for New Yorkers. We are providing $350 million in additional funds to re for repairs to NYCHA, building on our $1 billion investment made in the preliminary budget. We are also committing an additional $1.9 billion to create or preserve 10,000 apartments for New York households earning less than $40,000 a year. 5,000 of these units are reserved for seniors and 500 for veterans. This raises the city's contribution to Housing New York to $10.1 billion. And we are working to keep New Yorkers in their homes by providing anti-eviction legal services for tenants in housing court. At the same time, our work to help keep New York more affordable for seniors continues. Our efforts to expand the senior and disabled homeowner property tax exemption are working. The legislation passed through the State Senate last week. This expansion will give 32,000 New York City homeowners an average property tax break of $1,750. And we are committed to working with you to address other senior issues, that can, other serious issues that confront our seniors. The executive budget adds investments in public safety that have made New York City the safest big city in America. For example, it expands ShotSpotter technology into nine square miles of neighborhoods in the Bronx, Staten Island, and Manhattan. We must also protect vulnerable populations. In the executive budget, we fund legal representation for immigrant New Yorkers facing deportation and other immigrant challenges and it tackles some of the most urgent problems facing New York, including the opioid crisis and domestic violence. This budget addresses other quality of life issues that affect New Yorkers on a daily basis. To ease commutes for Staten Islanders, in September we are bringing lower level boarding to ferries at Whitehall and St. George terminals. And we will invest $100 million to close the gap in the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway. We are also expanding the organics program, expanding the curbside e-waste program to Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens, providing more New Yorkers with a safe way to dispose of unwanted electronics. These efforts build on our past quality of life investments, which have included strengthening and expanding paid sick leave, funding Thrive New York to help New Yorkers who face mental illness, making major improvements to parks as part of the Anchor Parks and Community Park initiatives, providing IDMYC cards to nearly one million New Yorkers. In conclusion, we have responded to the uncertainties and challenges we face by maintaining historic reserves, expanding our savings program, 
while continuing to make investments that strengthen New York's future. And as we move towards adoption, we look forward to continuing our work with the Council to address our challenges and meet the needs of New Yorkers. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Director. Um, thank you for your testimony. So I'm just going to jump right into capital and then um, go from topic to topic before we hear from Majority Leader Van Bramer, followed by Councilmember Lander. Um, while we understand that agencies like Parks, DDC, DOT, EDC, or SEA operate differently, serving different functions, the Parks Department and the Department of Design and Construction continue to lag behind other agencies when it comes to efficiently completing capital projects. Um, and, you know, I recognize that at DDC, it's not all capital projects, it's just certain capital projects um, that lag. What are some of the constraints that OMB is aware of that an agency like Parks or DDC operate under that the other agencies do not, that we will be able to eliminate or create a more efficient process? Because as I've asked every commissioner that's come to testify about this question, it seems that it's not even in the agent, the agency isn't the issue, it's really somewhere in the procurement process um, where they've seen most of the lag, but I'm not sure if that's what you see on your end um, as one of the challenges uh, within the capital projects. So, both agencies are making improvements. I know it's, it's not as much as we would like to see and as much as they would like to see, but both agencies have made improvements. They have, they have shortened the timeline. We have invested uh, in this budget in, 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 a, in a pro we have put forward um, activities that should help in the early stages of both design, of, of, for design, to give them additional funds and resources to allow them to do more pre-scoping and more early design work, which allows them then to have a better understanding of the actual cost and the estimates. Front right, the front end planning unit in DDC, thank you. Um, and, uh, and the same effort is happening at parks. So there are attempts, we recognize this, and we're working with the commissioners to see if we can address it. They do have unique problems, right? There are many more small projects that these agencies, particularly at parks, that, that, that cre I think create added complexity to it. Um, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working with you, and I, I'm quite sure it's gonna come up several times at this hearing, it did at the first hearing, that we, we you, you've articulated very thoughtful concerns. We share those concerns. We should be working with you on additional ways to address those concerns. And we're more than open to doing that, and we want to do that with you. And, and we're committed to doing that with you, To We've already reduced the time periods. We need to do that more, and we need to make sure that our estimates are more accurate up front so that projects that you care about and we care about can are, are more, that we're more consistent about the accuracy of those estimates and then the timeline would be better. Right, and it seems like the number one reason why the estimates get blown out of proportion is because of the time. Um, because the longer a project I, takes, the commissioner testified that it's just getting more expensive to actually build in New York City. So time, time is clearly a, a, a cost factor and it adds to it. Um, uh, once again, having the right the right pre, the right information as we enter a project, so that both the council and the administration knows exactly what a project costs. So we put the right funding in. We don't have to come back. That we minimize change orders. Change orders add time. They add cost. So that that's a shared goal. So we share this with you. We have an ambitious capital plan, as you pointed out, and we think it's the right size capital plan. We accept that that the spacing, the timing of that capital plan needs to be redistributed. We need to work with you on that. We did eliminate a lot of unnecessary appropriations at your request. Mm -hmm. There are many more things that we need to do in that process. Um, I, I've said this before, this really is not as much a parks issue, although parks occasionally will have major serious, uh, um, serious construction, but on the very big construction projects, uh, for example, the BQE and other Department of Transportation, not having the same benefit that the state of New York has on design build, which clearly adds on major construction projects years to, to a project, 
uh, is un, is really unacceptable. And that's un, so there are statutory changes, and there are help that we need from Albany that will assist us on the bigger projects. So just so that we could get this on the record, if we would have if if we would have been approved for design build, what would, how much time would that have potentially eliminated from our projects? So we had identified uh, during the state budget process about 10 projects, and we believe that it would save on those 10 major capital projects about 450 million off those projects, certainly serious amounts of, of financial savings, and that in many cases it would have taken years off the project. Thank you. Um, yes, we're going to be uh, continuing to talk about this, and especially as we shape the task force. And, and uh, the design bill, we have the bill has been introduced in, in uh, I know, in the assembly. Do we have a sponsor in the Senate, or? Do we? We'll come I hear Senator this. Felder's looking for things to do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back. And make okay, that. thank you. Um, Wanted to uh, focus a, a little bit on agency transparency. Um, while we applaud the administration's commitment to fund vital services such as legal and homeless services, transparency issues remain um, on how the current budget structure reflects the agency's spending, especially for HRA, DHS, law department, do it, and the office and uh, gun violence. Can we get a commitment from you to increase budgetary transparency for these agencies? In particular, personal service spending for HRA's legal services program area, um, and how the mayor's new homeless plan is funded in HRA and DHS expense and capital budget. So while we were going through these hearings, some of this is lumped in even in lines that descriptively aren't necessarily doing um, or, or are not funding what we think they're funding. So can we walk through this process before our adoption to clearly identify where we need more transparency with these new projects? Sure, we're happy to walk through that process. As you know, the, a year ago in the, uh, in, in the reconfiguration of DHS and HRA, part of that actually was to provide more transparency and to have a more consistent separation. So anything that adds to that, we're happy to do with you. We should sit down with the commissioner and walk you through that. Yeah, um, and so we'll have the, the recommendations for all of these agencies where we need to get um, the descriptions more clear. And you know, a perfect example, when you've done it right, because we also have to acknowledge when you've done it all right, is you have a unit of appropriation for 3K. So we can find 3K, there's a unit, it was done right. It just seems that with these other programs, we have a lot of lump sums um, and it takes an incredible amount of time and communication between both of our teams to figure out where this money is. We're, we should be sitting down with you and explaining that we're, that the goal was to give you that information, and so if that's not happening, then we're, we should be sitting down with you and make that happen. Okay. We're happy to do that with the commissioner. Okay. Um, hiring freeze. So I know the letter came out um, kind of towards the end of our, of our budget hearings. So every commissioner that I asked basically said the same thing, we're waiting for the notice, we're waiting for the notice. So that's why I'm asking you today. Um, what guidance have the agencies been given in terms of determining which hiring should be delayed? Um, and has the administration established a criteria by which agency should evaluate its current vacancies position? So, two different questions, right? Uh, the, the first is that we gave the agencies, the first deputy mayor and I sent, uh, sent guidance to the agencies of how we were going to implement the partial hiring freeze on, on managers, administrative, and support staff. Um, it was to give them a sense of what was going to happen. It did not, it does not change, so we should start with this, it does not change the personal service um, process that occurs at OMB right now, which are new hires and city agencies come through OMB for approval. That's going to continue and that process continues. On top of that, um, and, and then what we told the agencies, there are a group of positions that will only go through that OMB process. But then others that don't meet a certain criteria will go to a different level of review. So what are those things that are just going to stay in the OMB review? Um, maintaining, improving, maintaining uh, health and safety, direct, uh, direct caregiving, 
uniform positions uh, necessary to implement critical initiatives, new programs that we've all put out and said we want positions for. 3K is a good example, obviously. That has to go forward. Legally mandated by federal, state, local, or court order. Um, positions that, uh, that we have put forward, both at the council's request and, and the administration to create revenue that offset savings that are part of insourcing. We do those often. Those obviously will not go to another level. There are some civil service requirements that deal with provisional employees uh, being replaced, and that's a mandate by state civil service, and we're obviously complying with that. And if we did, as, as we are doing with Early Learn, where there is a functional interagency transfer from ACS to the Department of Education. That's obviously a, a, an approved function that's part of the budget, and that would continue. We then said that those positions that are not part of that will then be reviewed by, uh, by a working group made up of the first deputy mayor's office, uh, the com commissioner, two commissioners, DCAS and OLR, and OMB. And there'll be another review to see if those positions should move forward. So this is, as the mayor indicated, a partial hiring freeze. We did say we would come back at adoption and talk about what type of savings we believe we can, we can reach with, with this process. Okay, so I'm going through this. Who's left? Right. Who, who are we going to free? It just seems like there, there are still many. I, I, trust me, there are many. There are many personnel actions there that come through. There are thousands of personnel actions that come through. Okay. This so, was not a. The mayor didn't at any point. Uh, at no point did the mayor say this was a complete freeze on hiring. He right. articulated direct care service, and, and those things were not going to were not going to be. Implemented. So, is it still the management and administrative positions that we? Um, understood them to be? Is that yes. still within? Yes. yes. Okay. But, but this was articulating for the agencies, here are the kinds of positions that will only, that will continue through the traditional and ongoing OMB review process. Okay. So it, did this process add a layer of review? It does. It so does on those, on those positions that that don't meet, for example, if a position doesn't meet one of these criteria, then it would have an additional level of review. Okay, so Which and is consistent, I believe, with what the council has been asking us to do, and that gets to your second question to some degree, which is the vacancy question, right? Which you have asked us to review vacancies, and so part of this will will well well, it's not directly related; they are interrelated, and the vacancies will clearly the position uh, the in in certain agencies with large number of vacancies will obviously be part of this process and is it the management and administrative positions within those vacancies or is it vacancies as a total it would be any position it that's be, vacant that's vacant would still go through all positions are going to continue to go through the OMB process. Okay. The Department of Education is the chancellor's instituting her own process to mirror this, which is also something the council has asked. And all vacancies will be going through the OMB process. The ones that don't meet these criteria will then go through this added level of review. Okay. Um, so is there a targeted savings goal or a no, targeted number? Once again, we'll, the mayor said that we would come back uh, at adoption and talk about what we believe we can achieve with this. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about some things that came up during the hearings. Um, several commissioners alluded to or actually stated um, that they were still in conversations with uh, you over in particular ACS, DIFTA, and DOE, and they wanted to ensure that we are aware of any additional revenue because they're still engaging in new needs. It seemed that the conversation, they're still identifying new needs with OMB. So on both of those agencies, the council has, in the first, my first hearing, and I assume with the agency chair, with the agency commissioners, uh, the council raised additional questions about whether new needs were needed. Seniors, uh, there, there were, there was a, 
fairly extensive exchange, and we agreed to work with you right. um, on seniors and additional, additional needs of the senior community. I said it in my testimony this morning. So we're in that process with you uh, to see at adoption what, what other resources we can provide to that community. On, uh, on ACS, um, on, on ACS, as you know, we, uh, we have a new commissioner. The commissioner has been also another area where there have been concerns in, uh, in prevention and in child protection services. So we are, and as they are with you, we are in a conversation with them. Is there anything that needs to be done quickly at adoption that would help us in these two areas? And that's the conversation we're in. So I'm going to circle back with you. And remember, we did add things. I should add, we added significant program, programs to ACS in the executive budget for right. those very purposes. Right, and, and, and that's why I wanted clarity, because we have add, added programs. ACS in particular is going through several levels of monitors and evaluations Correct. on Correct. what works and what doesn't work. That's right. Um, so just I wanted to understand, because, you know, when you present us the executive budget and while we are negotiating through adoption on things that we'd like to see added. Um, it just seemed that DIFTA was still engaging in conversations for funding. Um, and we just wanted to be clear that there so, isn't revenue that is going to come out of left field. No, no. The, the, uh, you, we're all watching the same revenue, the same tax, uh, the same tax numbers. The, you may have a different, uh, your staff may have a different view of, uh, of how, our, our, obviously, our. Our, our forecast is extremely cautious, as you know, both on revenues, on debt service. Um, we think that's the right thing to do. Uh, this is a little side, but clearly if we look around to other states, we're seeing reports of huge cash flow problems uh, all around us. As a matter of fact, across the country, we're not, we really did not have that problem here because of our cautious revenue forecasting. So you may, you may have disagreements that we'll have to work out on the revenue side. On, on the spending side, again, on DIFTA, I, really it is part of the, uh, it really comes out of the questions the council has been asking and are there additional things we should pre be providing. On ACS, on an ongoing basis, I think it's the responsible thing for us to constantly say, are there additional things we should be doing for child protective services and for preventive measures to provide additional protection? And, and there are many reviews going on, and if those reviews, um, if those reviews point to either of us that we should be adding more resources, then we're taking that seriously. Okay. Um, I know that you mentioned this in your tes testimony, and thank you for being so detailed, actually, on the impacts that um, the, propo the president's proposed budget would have. Um, and the Republican Congress seems pretty clear um, that they are also all over the place, right? So that's what we have. We have total confusion um, in the federal government. But, you know, I would like to know if we can at least agree that we probably should begin to start not, we're going to fight this together till the end. We are your partner in this, and we're going to do that. But at what point do you turn to your commissioners and say, we may, we should start looking at some contingencies? Not that you would share, but that, you know, this process of, worst case scenario they're preparing for because commissioner after commissioner testified that they're just going to fight, that there really isn't. And maybe there was one or two, I think um, uh, um, the NYCHA commissioner said, that, you know, obviously that they're looking at contingency in case, worst case scenario. But I think everyone else pretty much was saying we're just going to fight this. So at what point do you feel um, is the right time for us to start thinking of contingencies? So. Not to repeat myself, but and and but you're going to repeat said, yourself. Well, look, the the these the cuts in that proposal of Tuesday were devastating. I mean, you said it, I said it, the mayor has said it, and they are almost all consuming, right? I mean, they have a huge impact not just on the city of New York and and our residents, but they have a huge impact on the state of New York. I mean, the state of New York, not only are these, if, if, if it is true that the, that the federal budget and the ACA repeal, and by the way, there's still confusion, you're absolutely right, but if those two Medicaid cuts are, are, are 
additive, as they suggested, then that's 35% cut to Medicaid or more. Hmm. I mean, that's quite incredible. And, and, then, and then on top of that, to say in the, in the ACA repeal that New York State will be directed on how it funds its portion of Medicaid, uh, it's quite incredible action that's going to have profound repercussions on us. And are we, the, so the first line of this is to say, no, it's not acceptable and that we're going to do everything we can to fight that. And it turns out that in, and this certainly doesn't end, which is going to be a very difficult battle, but, but it turns out that in the, continu in the, in what we call a continuing resolution, but is actually the end mm -hmm. of the, was a federal omnibus bill, that the $17 billion of cuts, there were $17 billion proposed by the president for the last five months of this current federal fiscal year, and none of that happened. And in addition, we received, which there were many doubts about, there was funding for 61 million to reimburse New York City and other communities for security for the president. Uh, beyond that, and, and I'm going to keep saying this too, beyond that, the savings that we're putting forward, the first time this administration has done November January and April in each update, in each part of our budget, more and more savings, the partial, the partial freeze, cautious, but nevertheless a partial attempt to start another level of review on hiring, looking with you at the vacancies, and then putting a level of reserves that by any measure, however we try to measure that, whether it's on city revenues, spending, or anything, these are the highest level of reserves that we've achieved together of any city administration. Those are protective measures. Those are ways to say that we are being careful about the uncertainty we face. So I'm not gonna repeat everything because we're just gonna be repeating back and forth to each other. Um, we're not on the, on the same page uh, when it comes to those numbers um, and we will continue to negotiate after um, the hearings before adoption. Um, on this. I wanted to just pivot um, to the human services contracts. As you are aware, the value of many of the city's human services contracts is not sufficient to support the actual cost to deliver services. Nearly 20% of the city's nonprofit providers are insolvent, and 40% have less than two months' worth of funding to cover services readily available. DHS is the only human service agency whose executive budget includes additional funding to right-size shelter provider contracts. The remaining agencies that fall under human services have yet to address budgetary shortfalls for contracted services. As you are well aware, the council in its preliminary budget response called for a right-sizing of the human services contracts. Is Irwin B currently working with the city's other human services to right-size their contract and fully fund personal services and other than personal services costs based on the services that nonprofit organizations are contracted to provide? So we, we inherited a situation where as with our workforce and employees, there were no contracts when we started this administration. Now we're complete contracts with basically all of our unions. With the human service providers, they had seen dramatic cuts, including at the agencies that we were just discussing. DIFTA, ACS had dramatic cuts under the, uh, the end of the prior administration. Those were being reflected in what was happening the human service providers. We have, over the course of these three and a half years, been addressing their problems. We did together a two and a half percent wage adjustment two years ago. We accelerated the minimum before the state law had come into effect. We funded the first, the 1150, and then the $15 minimum wage. We have now proposed a year ago, or not maybe six months, uh, half a year ago, we made a, an agreement with the daycare workers and the daycare providers that gave them a pattern conforming uh, increase. And in the preliminary budget, we put forward for all these human service providers, for their workers, 2% for fiscal year 18 wage increase, 2% in 19, and another 2% 
in, tw in 2020. That alone is $200 million when fully annualized. That is not ignoring this sector. That is recognizing how important this sector is. We have, we have done, um, it, it's not true that we have only done base adjustments for DHS. We actually, and, and you know this well, we made a major adjustment in Beacons, for example, which was the first adjustment since the creation of the program. They had gone over 20 years with no increase in rates until last year when we together gave them a significant rate increase to recognize, to recognize the needs of the Beacon program. We did the same, and we had done many adjustments over the past two years for the Early Learn program. Going forward, what we said last year and what we have done now in the executive budget was we looked at an area that was very important to all of us, and that was DHS and our shelter providers, and to right size to one, get their contracts in order, which is happening, and I know Commissioner Banks has testified to that, that he'll have, he'll have most of the contracts in place by the end of this fiscal year. So having the contracts in place, having the wage adjustments in place, and then moving forward with a model budgeting, not a minor, not a minor amount of money, um, when fully implemented, well over a hundred million in adjustments being made to the DHS social service providers. We are talking to that community. We recognize how important they are to the delivery of our services, and we're talking to the community, and we're talking to commissioners about how we proceed. The DHS adjustment actually took a year. We had contracts that over the years, different rates were being provided, some things were being reimbursed, some things were not being reimbursed, they were really all over the place. That's what we inherited, that's what we're fixing. And that's what we're in the process of doing. And we've committed that we will be talking to them about other areas in the not-for-profit community about how to reflect their cost. Obviously, it's part of the whole balance that, uh, that we do together on addressing the needs of, of the entire human service sector. So I just think that at this point, uh, currently, and, and we understand the proposed 2%, the nonprofit sector is saying we are struggling. And in many ways, these are our partners. Government can't do this alone. We're talking about doing a lot of support work for families. Um, the mayor often talks about vulnerable communities. These are the organizations that are providing the services in our neighborhoods. And if they're coming to us and saying, we can sustain ourselves, this 2%, um, I don't think anyone's going to say, we don't appreciate the 2%, but it clearly isn't enough. So um, I would hope that we will continue to engage in these conversations um, to get to a, uh, at least to get to a better plan as we plan these, um, the growth in, in the coming years that we can increase percentages and you know talk about percentages that may be more adequate um, to help shore up our nonprofits because I do believe that we're in crisis and they've been very clear about expressing that. So we agree they are very important and I think that the administration has shown how important they are. Unlike the prior administration, we actually made them part of a wage pattern consistent with what city employees were getting. So we did, it's, it's over a 6% increase over those three years. On top of what we did, I'm actually being corrected, it's, it's almost near $250 million of wage adjustments when fully implemented. That's, that clearly shows our commitment. Do we need to do more? Well, obviously, we're saying we need to do more and we're committed to doing more, and the money we're putting in in DHS for the model budgeting, and what we did for the Beacons last year, and what we did for the early learn programs for the prior two years, and the agreement with 1707 and the daycare and the daycare providers last year, all reflect our desire and our, and our recognition of how important they are to the programs that we jointly care about. So can you um, walk me through what we've learned from the model budgeting? On DHS? Yeah. I, I'm happy to give you, I, I want to make sure I do this properly. We're happy to follow up and give you details. I'll, I, and once again, uh, if we're meeting with uh, Commissioner Banks, we can do that together. I mean, he went through that process for a whole year. 
on how they rationalize uh, how they rationalize the rates and uh, and how they assumed costs. So I, we're happy to sit down and do that. I would recommend we do that with uh, with the commissioner. Okay, um, so we'll follow up. Hopefully, we can get this in I, for the adoption. That, we can do that immediately. Okay, great. Um, I just my last question for this round. Um, there was. Uh, during the health and hospitals executive budget hearing, the council raised concerns about the transformation plan, specifically the $100 million placeholder in fiscals 2020 and 2021 for development opportunities. Um, it just seems that this development opportunity was just going to keep raising this $100 million. Um, but there wasn't, I didn't get a clear plan. Can you outline the process that led to the city's adding 200 million total in projected revenue from development opportunities in this plan? So, uh, the, you heard from the, uh, the acting head of Health and Hospitals, uh, who's done a very successful job in this year. We believe the transformation plan for the current year, we should step back for a minute, the transformation plan for the current year is on track, actually in some respects exceeding that. Uh, and that's a very positive sign that many thought would not happen. Um, at this point in time, we don't believe additional resources are needed. In the original transformation plan of, of well over a year ago now, the transformation plan did say there may be development opportunities uh, at the sites of uh, health and hospital, including uh, there are some sites that they're not using at this point and that there may be development opportunities. It was actually a modest amount uh, to say that uh, in, the, in the end of this financial plan that there may be 200 million of available resources from development opportunities using, using land uh, more wisely and seeing if there are other opportunities there. That's all that reflected. Okay, it just um, it does not reflect a specific. We don't have at this point to tell you that here is a specific okay, project that's or a specific piece of land. It is an assumption based the potential on of the empty right. space that you have. Correct. Okay, um, okay, um, that's what we wanted clarity on. And also, um, we had asked the commissioner, but perhaps you can help us um, as council members. There might be development up. These hospitals are in our districts, of course. and many of us are looking to build new schools. We're looking to build new precincts. We're looking to build a lot of new things. So, if we have an opportunity to identify locations that we may not normally have within the portfolio of access. I think um, we would like, as the council, we would like to work with both OMB and h, &H and um, that before it goes to a developer necessarily, that we have the opportunity to look at what we can do with, um, with the potential of bringing sites up. So we agree completely and we'll make sure that happens. Okay, great. So in my round two, I wanted to follow up on Moya, the general corporation tax, Healing NYC, a question on DIFTA, um, but I'll come back in my second round. Um, we will, we've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal and Rodriguez. We will now hear from Majority Leader Van Bramer, followed by Council Member Lander. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and to the Director. It is no secret that it is raining an awful lot uh, this month, and certainly today, but I want to uh, use that as an opportunity to highlight that somewhere in the city of New York, in fact, I'm relatively certain that in just about every borough, there are libraries that are leaking right now. Uh, this is a serious situation. And I know I always talk about libraries and culture uh, because I'm the chair of the committee, but I also represent a lot of people, a lot of people who need those libraries, and we desperately need our libraries to be in good operating order. There is a $150 million request for capital in this budget on behalf of the libraries that would address these critical maintenance issues so that on a rainy day like today and a rainy month like this month, our libraries can open, they can be safe, they can be secure, and they don't have to have buckets uh, in children's rooms and in meeting rooms. So I want to ask you, Dean, is that $150 million request something that you think is worthwhile? And is the administration seriously discussing this? And will we have a meaningful 
discussion about including that in this budget. So I have to step back for a moment and remind that, you, that successfully together we actually have done significant amounts of investments in libraries. And the first multi-year commitment that the libraries have had on capital. Instead of doing it on an annual basis, two years ago we made a significant commitment. We have expanded to six-day service on libraries and done significant operations. We've met major capital needs of the libraries. Uh, there are always significant needs out there. I'm not minimizing that. Uh, this is part of our conversation with you about what those needs are. Another place where the commitment level uh, needs work and needs improvement because there are capital projects uh, that the libraries have where they're having a hard time moving forward on those capital projects. So it's another area to go back to the very first question on capital where, where I think we all need to see some improvements um, in addition to talking about what additional resources may be available. We need to make sure that the resources we've put forward are actually being used. No one wants to see library capital projects move faster than me, including in Hunter's Point. But let me just uh, uh, get from you on the record that this $150 million critical capital maintenance request is on the table and is something that the administration is seriously considering. Well, we are in discussions with you, and I, we understand that one of the council priorities is additional capital. Uh, I'm pointing out that we have successfully with you in the past made made really significant commitments, but we also need to be concerned that we're not simply, it really goes right back to the first question, not putting additional resources and then nothing happens. That's right, which I think also gets to the point of, of OMB working with us and the library systems to allow for more pass-through projects so the libraries can manage those projects themselves, which I think would bring them the ability to bring those projects in under budget and on time. So, we're, in a much more frequent manner. So we're happy to, that's a conversation we should be happening, but we should make sure that that's the actual result of those and that the libraries can actually handle the additional, the additional effort and resources it takes to do those. There are a lot of very small projects that, that are handled and it may, be, it may be more difficult than it appears on its face. Uh, we should definitely pursue that. I just want to say uh, also, the investments that we have made, baselining $343 million for six-day library service and the several hundred million in capital are great achievements that we've done together, this administration and this council. I'm very proud of that. But we need to go and keep uh, uh, making progress on this very critical issue. I want to quickly address uh, culture in the arts because you mentioned all the devastating cuts at the hands of the Trump budget but didn't mention that in fact President Trump uh, followed through with his threat to essentially abolish the NEA, the NEH, the IMLS and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Your Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, our Commissioner of Cultural Affairs has already said that that elimination would cost New York City cultural organizations well over $50 million in direct support, which would devastate many organizations, including our smaller out-of-borough nonprofit cultural organizations. As you know, there is a $40 million request for increase to culture and the arts. There was a $10 million increase by, uh, in the budget last year that has not been restored or baselined. We need that funding. Can you address that and how seriously this administration takes culture and the arts and Donald Trump's assault on culture and the arts in the city of New York? So let, let me start with the, your first point about the, the list I gave. I gave one page of devastating cuts. I, we could spend uh, hours going through other devastating cuts. So by no means, if I left something out, I can, uh, they're coming, section eight, huge amounts of cuts. Not on my list, actually, I didn't realize it in the beginning, but it was huge cuts to Section 8. We are learning every day more and more cuts that are in this budget. I, the intent was to give you examples of huge and significant, uh, significant examples of what would happen if this budget were to go through. So, and by no means was that uh, intended to be f a full list of every single thing the president's proposing to do, with none of which should be happening, including obviously what's happening on the cultural side. Uh, again, we worked with you 
very closely the last year and said, okay, there should be an additional allotment for cultures. We do care about cultural institutions and we reflected that in last year's budget. And, uh, you know, again, this part of a conversation we're having with you. Critically important that particularly as uh, Donald Trump assaults culture and the arts uh, and, and thinking people everywhere that we, the city of New York, uh, come back and support the arts right. in an even I, more meaningful way. I, again, back to the the answer I had with the chair before. Any place where we see these devastating cuts, though, we should be fighting those devastating cuts, Absolutely. not ending up in a position of simply backfilling and trying to backfill fill what's something that should not happen at its very basis. Resist. Thank, thank you, Majority <laughs> Leader. Um, we will hear from Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Madam Chair and Budget Director. And, and I appreciate your one-page summary of the lowlights of the, of the budget, which I've already gotten some feedback on on, on Twitter. One, one thing I guess I want to ask about that I, I might have missed in the budget, amongst all those devastating cuts, one thing that he had said he was going to do a lot of was help pay for infrastructure for our crumbling bridges yes. and roads. Did I miss the infrastructure part I, of the we, Trump we budget? Both, we both missed it. We're still looking. Uh, so I, but I don't believe it's in there. Yeah, I don't think so either. And so for all that talk, you know, not one penny in, in uh, an infrastructure plan for a city that has very significant infrastructure needs. Um, uh, I appreciate that we are, uh, are putting significant dollars to infrastructure. And I think, you know, the chair and I, while we, I'm indeed going to keep pushing on capital projects management reform, wholeheartedly agree that this is an important time for New York City to have the capital program that we have to invest in our infrastructure. And I appreciate you guys stepping up to do it. Um, I do want to uh, say a little more about the need for capital projects uh, management reform. We're, we're putting out a little issue brief today um, that just takes a look at reading. your capital projects dashboard, the city's projects, over $25 million. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to guess these numbers, but Thank you. Uh, of them, of those projects, and these are all just city data, 44% um, of the projects are severely late and 42% of the projects are severely over budget. Of the 44 projects that are both severely late and severely over budget, 43 are managed by DDC. And on median, $30 million over budget and 700 days late. And that's on top of the slow build report that Center for an Urban Future put out earlier that showed that for the library and cultural projects, 930 bucks a square foot, about twice what commercial construction costs in New York City. So while we did indeed, look, I know you want to improve this. I know your commissioners want to improve it. I know lots of people are taking lots of steps. But it doesn't feel to me like we are taking the more fundamental look at what's not working in this system. The DDC fact suggests actually that maybe we should look at whether the state-granted superpowers that EDC and the School Construction Authority have or something more agencies should have. Obviously, we support design build. But the steps we are taking are not yet close to the level of reform that we need in this system. So. We have some ideas that we're proposing in, in legislation, but the truth is a real top to bottom look, which is not organized by can we shave a few more days here or there, but which is organized by this system is not delivering what we wanted to deliver. How do we re-engineer it to get there? So we're, that's the work that we are eager to start doing with you. Okay, so this is not new. It is not New York new. City's capital. No, no, and, and I've been saying it through the prior administration. And this no. is not the fault of the de Blasio administration, but we got a shared responsibility to do more to fix it. We agreed. So uh, I agree. I, I said that at the first hearing. Um, I, I look forward to your recommendations. We need to work together to figure out how this is. I, I do think we're... We need to be careful. We need to be thoughtful about this. Of course. Um, and what improvements can be made at DDC? What improvements can be made at parks? There may be many different answers to how to address this. Once again, many of these are small, are small programs. We are making incremental improvements. Thank you for that. That's true. Our approach to the capital budgeting is much more encompassing and inclusive this year, including city planning, as the charter had envisioned, really for the first time. Um, so we're trying to address that, have a better sense of this, but can we, should we be doing improvements? Do we need to be doing improvements? Yeah, we, we do agree. All right, and I'll just note, while small projects are no doubt a problem, the stats I gave are from the projects $25 million and, okay, and above. Um, That's fair. 
Uh, the other question I'll just ask in my remaining time uh, is about the city's Commission on Human Rights. I was very encouraged the other day to see them launch this wonderful new yes. campaign. You do have rights. It's very inspiring. I love that at this moment when we can't count on the federal government to protect people's civil and human rights, we are stepping up to do it. I expressed concern in the preliminary round that we weren't doing enough because people's human rights complaints have grown substantially to over a year. But then I was dismayed to see in the executive budget, I think it actually got worse, at least as I read it, we cut their communications budget. So things exactly like this You Do Have Rights campaign wouldn't be possible next year. Um, can you address what we're doing to make sure, I guess, both that we are able to communicate and project what we, uh, our values here, but also that people have the ability to get their claims processed so that we aren't letting discrimination linger uh, for over a year? So we have, look, we, we've done this together. We once again inherited a budget that had been decimated. We have done over 100, well over 100 percent increase in that agency's budget. Uh, certainly no one. They just cut it so low that 100 percent wasn't even that much. It, it, was, it was significant. <laughs> it was significant. New, new space, new headcount. I mean, we are trying to address their needs. It, uh, once again, if we, uh, if we think uh, we're not hesitant, if we believe at some point and in during any one of our budget modifications, including adoption, that we need more resources for that, we do think it's a big priority. We agree on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. And um, Director Foulihan, it's great to see you and your team always um, on top of it. So I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to follow up on two things, um, starting with Councilmember Lander's point about historic cost overruns. Um, so a couple of years ago, as you know, a watchdog um, group, Class Size Matters, identified a, a, a contract that, you know, smelled funny, and City Hall did something historic. Uh, you, you negated the contract and had them rebid it. Um, and it ended up saving the city hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, what I'm wondering is, is there anything else since that time, because we talked about it quite extensively, um, that you've unearthed, that OMB has unearthed, that is, have you identified anything similar to that since that time? I don't believe anything that's similar to that. That does not mean that through our normal process and the staff, and I'd actually have to go back on this, that we don't uh, question agencies about contracts and development and whether there's a better way to do it. We've certainly been doing that where we insource. Uh, DOE and the executive budget does significant insourcing. That was actually part of a process that included would you need that contract or there better ways to do that. So there, I, I, so I don't, I'm a little concerned about using that simply as, as the model, what happened uh, a couple of years ago. But do we question? Of course we question. A and does that lead to, uh, to better government and efficiencies? Of course it does. Okay. Um, it, you know, I am regularly getting uh, suggestions from that whistleblower about specious contracts. And um, I would like to know that OMB is doing a regular audit of their contracts. I understand the unusual, the relationship DOE has with the city. It's a, it's, you know, quasi state. Um, by the same token, you know, um, even city funds pay for many contracts that are suspect. Recently, I was made aware of a $600,000 contract to a group that identifies internships for your CTE schools. Mm -hmm. One of the CTE schools reached out to me and says, I don't understand why the city pays for anyone to do that. We do that for free at our school. It's part of our mission. So. I mean, well, so I, I would want to know that well, DOE is regularly being investigated. And here's, here's my point, that if we were to do that, I mean, Councilmember Lander is talking about hundreds of millions of dollars on the capital side. I think if we were to do that more systemically, 
that we would have available to us money to spend on the things that we so desperately need. Let's look at the human service contracts. There is no question in my mind that this administration has done more than any other administration before it. Well, let's put it a different way. Previous administrations caused the problem by underfunding, systemically underfunding our human service contracts, both the workers and the funding they need for maintenance. This administration has done two things. One, begun to address the PS issues by increasing salaries. Also, you've done remarkable in right-sizing on the homeless service contracts and the beacons that you mentioned. What I'd like to hear today is that there would be a understanding that you would put in the budget uh, an OTPS equivalent to the PS funding, in other words, follow the same pattern, 2%, then 2%, and so on, and that a commitment to right size as we go forward with the DIFTA contracts for our senior centers, um, with you know all of our work that we do with mental health uh, facilities, that's the commitment that I'm looking for, and that, frankly, 80,000 workers in this sector um, are looking for as well. So a few answers. On the Department of Education, we're, we should talk to the Department of Education on that particular program and any concern you have, and we should address it. I'm not going to assume that because one provider disagrees with the results of a procurement or a process that something was inappropriate doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't ask the question, so I'm happy to follow up with you with the department on that issue. Where we can find savings, we should always be finding savings. On the question of the non-for-profit community and the human service providers, I'm not gonna repeat everything I did before because I did a fairly extensive litany. And I heard it, and, and the public and you, heard and it. And you heard it, and it's there. And are we committed to working with them? We are very committed to working with them. We're in conversations, as you well know. You and I have been talking about this. We're gonna to continue to talk about this. And we'll uh, try to address the, these very complicated issues, once again, in a balanced manner, what, what uh, resources we have available, how we can move forward with them. The goal, <coughs> the, excuse me, the goal clearly was to move forward with them. We would not have done, this is the only one I'll, I'll reemphasize, we would have not done basically a pattern conforming wage adjustment over three years if we didn't believe that their long-term security was important to us. Uh, I'm, with permission, Chair, I'm not addressing that at all. I, I believe your commitment. What they're asking for now is a similar commitment for the increased cost of maintenance, of technology, and of um, rent, for example, uh, cleaning supplies, things that have, in costs that have increased over the past 20 years that we are now asking private philanthropists to pay for. Can you, uh, what a waste of money. The private philanthropists should be paying for new and innovative ideas. That's what philanthropy is for. Can you imagine us saying to a construction contractor, here, we're going to give you 80 cents on the dollar, and you should just cross-subsidize with your other bridge jobs or, or luxury high-rise jobs in order to pay for any cost, costs that are not covered by our contract? We would never do that. Just the opposite. A bridge contractor tells us the cost is X, we pay them X. When there's an overage and it's a million dollars more, we pay them a million dollars more. I know you're working hard to right size. What I, I'm asking for in this budget now is a commitment to fund the increased cost in maintenance that is uh, unfairly burdening our providers. It would be like saying to the uh, DIFTA, we're only gonna, we're not gonna fund you for the increased cost in supplies and IT. We're, we're gonna stop giving you money for IT and supplies. It, good luck with that. That's what we're doing to our OTPS, for, in terms of OTPS, for our human service providers. And, um, but I wanna end by saying, I do thank you for what's been done. No other administration has done that. They dug a hole. You're getting us out of it, but we need a little bit more to go. 
So again, we're in conversations with them, as you know, to try to figure out a way that we can do a balanced approach to address those needs. We have now made hundreds of millions of dollars investment. The wage piece it will end up being 250 million, and we've made other investments that total by the end of this four-year financial plan almost $400 million. That is a serious commitment to this community. I'm not suggesting, and I never did, that there weren't other needs, and are there ways for us to talk about that and address that? Yes, but at the same time, we have to recognize how much we've done in this community. That's right, you're digging us Thank out of you, a really council big member. hole. Um, we'll put you Thank on the you. second round. Uh, council Thank Member you. Rodriguez, and we've been joined by Council Member Cumbo. Thank you, Chair. First, Two recommendations. One is when it comes to the fair fair, as you know, like uh, the community cost raise the poverty rate by 2.2 percent points, uh, with a greater impact of pushing people into poverty, based on the study that had been released. Uh, we're working with the mayor, uh, with the effort to take 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty by 2025, but also we know that the cost of transportation is so high for working class New Yorkers. It, I encourage the administration, even though we know that the mayor has said that he understands the importance of the fair fair campaign when it comes to the merits. We get it, it should be the MTA, but the MTA is not doing it. And this thing that we as a city, we had, we had jumped in because we said we need to do it. We cannot wait for Albany. So I encourage the city to continue this conversation, especially in the negotiating team from the council, and try to do phase one of this plan to put some money, some amount of million dollars to the phase one of the Fair Fair campaign. My second recommendation is when it comes to Vision Zero, the $3 million is not there for the educational awareness campaign of Vision Zero. It, it, and I think that, you know, not because this is an important initiative that the mayor embraced it, when he was elected, but it, in order for us to reduce by 2024 the number of pedestrians being killed, it, we will do it not only with a new law, enforcing the law, but also changing the cultural and the educational awareness uh, dollars is so important to uh, continue advertising the radio, TV, and newspapers. So, yes, recommendation for us to also be sure that we work together to put those $3 million that they are not there right now for the 2018 uh, budget. Question, uh, one related to DOT, uh, to transportation. You know, the governor made the announcement two days ago, uh, Amtrak is a mess, MTA is a mess, we take the train, two trains is running delay, uh, three trains, most of the train, the signal system is not working, that's the MTA, the city doesn't have, you know, the major power. However, when it comes to our buses, we can have an impact in our buses. And I think that I'm calling, I would like to know, you know, what is our plan to turn the buses that we have today in our street? as a above the ground train system. Because it's about, this is not only the MTA upgrading the technology, but it's also about the bus lane. It, I'm not, we are not doing enough enforcement with the, with the, when it comes to the bus lane. So what is our plan? What is the part that we are doing as the city responsibility to upgrade the infrastructure of the bus lane that we can say we are planning to run our buses faster so that people they don't have, it doesn't take more time for someone to take the bus than to walk when they go to work. So we have been working on uh, bus lanes and select bus routes and, and increasing uh, signal timing. So we have been trying to make improvements in, in the bus. Let, let's remember though, the, it is part of the MTA and well, that's city, I, I just, I, I just to, just to step back for a moment, though, the, the, we did make an historic commitment to the MTA capital plan. I just want to put that out there, a $2.5 billion commitment in the, M, in the current MTA capital plan. I just wanted to but, put yeah, that out. Yeah, but, you know, but my thing is that it is, I understand this 
some parts are related to the MTA. Enforcing is our part. You know, the time when the buses, they had to be, the lane had to be only dedicated to buses is our part, and we need to increase. So, so let's talk about this. I, I'm and, happy to have And we already have the Fifth Avenue as the only area in the city where we are, also in the t we are already using the technology that give priority to the bus drivers. So we need to learn from the already on technology in the Fifth Avenue. We My should, last question. So we should have that. We, we should get together and have that conversation okay. and what your thoughts are. Okay. And my last question is about three years ago, you came here and you say, an average of 50% of New Yorkers live on the poverty lines. This is what we inherit. Three years after, what are the numbers from the three years ago and today? Well, we know uh, the, the, the mayor, um, now, I think two weeks ago, put out the, uh, the, the new poverty statistics. And for the first time since the Great Recession, there was a reduction in near poverty. I will get you the exact numbers. I'll get you the numbers. I, I'll have to get the numbers of the at or near poverty from three years ago and the numbers now. There have been improvements. They are lower. No, they're lower. The at or near poverty numbers the mayor announced are lower. We'll, I'll, get you, I'll get you the comparison. Madam Chair, I think you should fill the budget director in on our hearing with the MTA, that highly enlightening Well, there was nothing to say. I can't even say anything because they didn't say anything to us. So there was no information with the MTA. Um, we will now hear from Council Member Combo. Thank you. I know that it was brought up um, earlier and also brought up at the last hearing with Commissioner Finkelpearl in regards to the $10 million um, not being baselined in this budget, um, also recognizing the fact that the original ask was not for $10 million, it was actually for $40 million, and wanting to know the status um, of that particular uh, allocation. Will it be baselined also in the future uh, we also want to know what is going to be the future of that because we also have the, um, the creative cultural plan that has been launched and announced. So the basic question is, the $10 million, will it be baselined? And will we also see that very critical increase of $40 million that the cultural community has been um, very anxious and patient? But it's getting to that breaking point where many institutions are um, questioning laying off staff, laying off uh, key organizations that they partner with. So it's really a big challenge at this time. So we are in discussions with you on what, uh, what should happen with the cultural piece. We did do, we did, as you know, at adoption last year, put the 10 million forward. That was fairly significant. It may not have been everything they wanted. And obviously we're talking to cultural institutions. At the same time, we're talking to other, uh, to the not-for-profit world about what their needs are and what they're confronting. And we're looking at that with you at this process. So it is part of the process and the discussion we're having with you uh, on what should be accomplished at adoption. Would you say that the Department of Cultural Affairs, in terms of their increases over the last four years, in terms of the larger agencies, of course, would you say that Department of Cultural Affairs has received uh, the least amount of increase over the last four years? I, actually, I will have to get back to you on where they fit in and the amount of resources, cultural affairs. I do think cultural affairs is, has, the agency certainly has been treated well, mm -hmm. and I do believe the, we made a significant commitment last year on the $10 million. The Moving right along to the MWBE commitment. So, as you know, the mayor had initially put in uh, $10 million, and then an additional $10 million to match that in terms of loans and bonding and that sort of thing. Where does that $20 million, has there been an understanding of how that money has been allocated? Is there an understanding if it will be uh, regenerated and also put forward in the budget so that that program can continue? Um, we recognize that program to be a pilot program initially right. um, with the understanding that there would be an increase over time. Yes, we on both programs, the uh, the pro, the the money has been in the executive budget was moved forward to the current year, 
uh, as my understanding, and I can have uh, the deputy mayor, Richard Burry, setting this up for the mayor, give you more detail, but my understanding is these programs, which are now getting started and are actually putting forward commitments. So why don't we give you, and I'll make sure that we give you an update on exactly where those programs are. Because I we know they mm -hmm. are moving forward and I know we're clearly committed to this and we're putting whatever resources are necessary. We continue those that funding into the upcoming fiscal year and we'll keep monitoring it with you. And the other question that I have is in regards to early learn, um, and early learn as it pertains to um, it's uh, that the universal pre-K program, a lot of our uh, organizations are very concerned because the RFP, um, as it pertains to early learn, has not been issued yet. And there's a great deal of concern, fear, and anxiety um, about what will be the future of our early learn programs. When will the RFP be issued? Will there have to be extensions in the contracts um, for the current early learn providers because the RFP has not been issued at this time. So several things on early learn. Mm -hmm. o over the past two years, we it's one of the examples I gave earlier on the non for profit on the nonprofit community and the human service providers. Early learn um, was under great stress with the beginning of this administration and we made several accommodations on reimbursement levels including going back into the prior administration to make sure that they were being properly reimbursed. So the administration has made a very strong commitment to, er to early learn. Last year, about six months ago, we made a, an agreement, we were part of an agreement um, with the day, with daycare, uh, with both the union and the daycare providers to provide a wage adjustment for their workers. In this executive budget, we are recommending that the, we are moving um, the early learn program from ACS over the next year to the Department of Education. So that, and to consolidate it under what now is the very successful UPK program. As part of that, we're also expanding, as the mayor announced, the 3K mm -hmm. uh, with two districts this fall. So part of when the next RFP comes out is actually part of evaluating and it will be worked on with both ACS and DOE as we move forward. <clears throat> when is the appropriate time to put out that new RFP? And, and I, so I don't have an immediate answer for you, but as we make this transition, we'll keep you posted on what we think is the appropriate time to issue that new RFP. Just wanna reiterate what my concern is there. My concern is with this transition that many of the um, culturally specific organizations that have been doing daycare provider work, um, particularly in the African American, Latino, and Asian communities that have been doing culturally specific daycare work in these transitions and in these RFP processes, they often get um, rejected from the RFP uh, proposal process on the back end side. And currently the major concern about that is that in order for you to be able to qualify for an RFP, you need to have a negotiated lease with the city of New York even to qualify. And currently many of our daycare providers have month to month leases that will not qualify them to uh, participate in the RFP process. And that's a big challenge that they're facing. Okay. so. Um We'll, we should continue this conversation. The goal is, has never been of this administration to harm and to, uh, to small community providers. Our goal has been to try to encourage that. So if that's, if that's the concern, as we're working through this transition, we should be in touch with you and those providers on how we can help them. And uh, happy to do that. And just one more thing, Chair, just to give me one more moment. Just want to ask you as Chair of the Women's Issues Committee, want to talk about the fact that 41% of single mother families with children live in poverty, according to U.S. Census figures. That's a staggeringly high number, more than twice the poverty rate. One in three working age women in poverty in New York City say they struggle to afford bus and subway fares. I know this issue has been discussed, but wanted to know in our budget, um, what are we planning to do, if any, at this point to address fair fares um, and phasing in fair fares for those who simply can't afford the expansions um, that we're seeing in MTA? 
the, look, the, the mayor, you know, and you heard him on this, he uh, is more than sympathetic towards this, but he believes the appropriate place this should be funded is by the MTA. The MTA has programs. This is the MTA sets the rates. They set the fair rates. This is where the, it should be addressed. That doesn't mean that there aren't many issues that we have worked on together to address affordability. That's why I raised the anti-poverty numbers of only, that were put out a week ago that said for the first time the poverty numbers that said for the first time those at or near poverty had actually declined since the Great Recession. We've done significant work to try to address that all through the programs that we support in the human service sector, uh, in, in education. Uh, it's one program after another has been directed at, at dealing with this problem. I also want to just come back one minute on the, uh, on the small community providers and early learn. Since mm -hmm. our goal, one of the things that we changed over the past two years was to address all early learn costs. So if for some reason a provide, you're hearing from providers that we're not doing that, then you should let us know because that was not the intent. The intent was to address their costs. This was one of the areas in the not-for-profit community that we believe we addressed. So I, we are not hearing those complaints. The extent that you're hearing those complaints, we should know that. I will certainly um, arrange to have a meeting with the providers in my district that are experiencing that anxiety about what the future of their 40-plus year organizations are going to be. So we should see how we can help them. That would be very appreciated. I thank you on that. And just we need to continue to find ways for particularly our single families, to be able to afford to ride the MTA to and from work. And it's great that we feel the sympathy, but when they get there to that token booth, they can't bring that sympathy with them. So we need to do more to work on that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Still morning here, all right? So, um, I'm going to put the labor hat on and talk about the uh, where we are in uh, upcoming collective bargaining and contracting and uh, and what that looks like where we are uh, in terms of um, have we set aside do we have the necessary savings uh, to continue uh, the patterns that have been established are we looking to do something different and of course uh, in doing so, I, I think we need to talk about health care, the health care gap in debt around not just active employees but retirees as well. And, um, and I think in the preliminary budget, we talked about the state of health care and those savings that we were hoping to achieve now, what that would look like, but as we move forward, um, a potential RFP uh, and what savings would look like in terms of providing uh, the future of health care for city employees. So uh, we are getting, it's, it's hard to imagine, but we're actually getting near the next round of collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what happens when you inherit a situation which had for in some cases seven years of no, uh, of no labor contracts. Um, as we approach that, we will continue to do it with the same respect we approached it in the very first day of the administration. Um, we have set aside funds in uh, 1%. As the contracts end, we have set aside a labor reserve in our out-year out financial plans, so we have provided uh, resources for that. The only, uh, the only thing we have said, as we did last time, is that we need to keep improving both the quality of care, of the health care that we provide for our employees, and we believe that we have made significant improvements and that no one had actually focused on this for two decades, that we're making significant improvements in the quality of health care, and we're making significant savings. In the upcoming fiscal year, in eight, the 18th fiscal year, we will achieve, with the, with the Municipal Labor Committee, $1.3 billion of savings. So that is something that together with them, we should want to continue as we move towards the next round of labor negotiations. So um, two things. First, uh, and, and, and I generally, we're generally on the same page, but I absolutely disagree with the quality of health care that is now being dispensed by our current provider. 
Um, I, I don't think it's the quality of health care that our, our, our workers, our employees, retirees deserve. I think that uh, all within the industry and all those outside of the industry are, are well aware that they're kind of on a last leg and the services being provided are indicative of that. But as we move forward, which is, which is basically the reason why we interjected the possibility of there being an RFP as we move right. forward. I, I apologize. I didn't mean to, uh, to in any way imply that an RFP and a, and a looking at other providers uh, should not be something to be considered. Obviously, as you know, we need to do that with our partners in labor and the Municipal Labor Committee. Um, once again, did we believe there can be more improvements in the quality of care that we're providing. We think we've made strides in that. We believe we've also saved funds in that. We believe we can do both of those things as we continue forward. I, I in no way meant to indicate that we were saying so we, we, we are So we are on target for the final year of 2018? We are. And, and that is the final year, right? It, so it we begin to talk year. about what health care would look like uh, beyond That's 2018, correct. which I, I think considering that we have these agreements that are now Agreed. beginning to be like a uh, really opportune time to have serious conversations uh, about that as well. Um, could we talk about some of the, some of the, uh, the, the, the uh, council member Cumbo before me talked about some of the MWBE contracting. I know when we were in the budget briefing, we, we uh, I think you got charged with uh, kind of investigating leveraging some of the resources that are being uh, the, the, the contracting resources that are going out throughout the city. Has there been in the last month and a half any um, update or response to that? I know, again, we have approximately almost nearly $2 billion in infrastructure investment going on in Southeast Queens, but none of the vendors nor the workforce reflect so the let, um, community. As I responded, let me, let me get let me talk to the deputy mayor and let's get a specific update. I know he's been working on this, but I'll touch base with him and we'll come back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna begin the second round, so this is a, a shorter round. I wanted to talk about the collections of the general corporate corporation tax sure. um, have been disappointing throughout the fiscal year. In fact, the executive budget, you're reducing your forecast of collections by 43 million compared to preliminary budget. Can you talk about the expected refunds for the GCT going forward and how it's influencing your forecast? So, so there, look, um, we're now two years from uh, we're two years from uh, from what we should all be proud of, which was a major modernization of the city corporate tax mm -hmm. that had been uh, called upon by the business community and finance community for over a decade. Um, uh, we achieved that. We also achieved when we did that, we reduced uh, corporate tax rates for small business, uh, and we we uh, reduced even beyond that the corporate tax rates for manufacturers. So it, it, this was a very successful uh, change that we made two years ago together. Um, it's, so several things are happening in the corporate tax at the same time. So we, we along with the state, now have a new, a new tax system. And the implementation of that tax system uh, has uh, clearly is causing some difficulty in our understanding um, what part of the corporate tax shortfall is due to changes in filing, understanding the tax versus corporate profits and what's happened over the past two years. So we're in the process of trying to understand that. We're being very cautious about our corporate estimates. Uh, we recognize that this scenario that given current, current revenue collections are declining and uh, you know we're just gonna keep working to try to understand what the ramifications of that are because there are many things happening. It's not simply corporate profits and what's happening there. It's also we did a very dramatic change. Mm -hmm. The state did and then we followed with a very dramatic change in our corporate tax structure and the interplay between those uh, we need to try to isolate so we understand uh, if we need to make any more adjustments going forward. 
So can you just walk me through, and I guess this is an example of that, of the city set aside of the $185 million in overpayments for 2015 when the tax reform first took place. And can you walk us through the purpose and how much of this has already been utilized? It was, once again, when we did corporate tax reform, it's a perfect example. We thought there had been uh, overpayments, and we booked that at the time. We are now taking that. Uh, so we, it, in, in our forecast on the corporate tax, it's included. So that 185 is now being recognized. Is okay. And how much of it do we have? Have we utilized so far? We, we, it's all incorporated. It's all utilized completely. Yes. So do you think that we made it need additional as you move forward? I once again, the corporate, even with that, the corporate tax is uh, year to date is declining, and we should be concerned and monitor that. We should be watching. Yes, the corporate tax and the banking tax, right? Right. Now, combining the right, right. Um, so, is there an, an, another number that you think, kind of, to help make up the the difference of, of possible, I guess, reimbursements? Or? I, at this time, I I don't have anything. At, at this time, we're not prepared to say here are changes we need to make in the corporate tax structure. We're not. We there. I think we need to. To get, it was very confusing. This was a confusing year. Some filers, some people were filing in March. Dean, if you're saying it's confusing, it, could you was, imagine what it means over here on this so side? Some people were filing in March. Some people were filing in April. There were different filing requirements. I think we're going to have to play this out for another year and then come back and assess what's the situation. So will we have to see an additional 80, 185 million again in a year? No, or? I don't believe so. Okay. So we'll see less of it, or you you won't see that modification ever again. Okay. But the question, the more fundamental question, um, as we look at corporate tax reform, were the it was a revenue neutral change? Is that revenue neutral change uh, coming through as we had right. planned, or are different? That was my next modifi question. Are additional modifications necessary at this point? I don't think uh, your staff or our staff can answer that. Okay. Um, personnel services and cost savings. Over the last several years, the city has recognized hundreds of millions of dollars in PS accruals each year from agencies operating under budget headcount. As the most recent headcount report, the city was operating under budgeted headcount by nearly 6,000 city-funded full-time positions. Although we do see significant headcount savings in the executive plan, can we expect to see more in the adopted plan, and if so, by how much? Um, I, I don't believe, so I'm, I'm not sure of the exact number. Obviously, every time we do a budget, we're making adjustments and we're looking, we're looking at the headcount. So we'll continue to do that. I know on a more longer term basis, you're asking us to look at the vacancies and we're obviously going to do that with you and that's going to take a more extensive period of time. Do you see you're um, proposing an additional citywide savings program before we 